I'm going to preface this by saying this is my way of sharpening. There are lots of ways of sharpening. Um, I sharpen to, to get my tools to do what I'd like them to do. All right. So uh, I use jigs, and uh, and so I really try and get repeatable stuff, and I'll go through those things that I use. It, uh, it's the same techniques when I'm up at Campbell teaching those folks because they've never sharpened. They think starting in lay, uh, starting and turning is buying a lathe, having no idea about the uh, quality of the edge of the tool, it, it, how important that is. I remember when I was first turning, I, I may have told some of you this before, but my birthday was coming up and so I asked, my wife asked me, what would you like for your birthday? And I said, well, you know what? There's a guy in town that sharpens stuff. Why don't you take my gouges over and have him sharpen them? <laughs> I'm thinking, that'll last me till my next birthday. <laughs> and he comes back, he called my wife and he said, um, well, do you want him English grind? Do you, you, you want him swept back? I had no idea what he was talking about. Him. So, um, and they were uh, high carbon steel to boot. They weren't high speed steel. So. Um, I learned pretty quickly that no, they don't last for a year. So <laughs> the next purchase you do, you have to go out and buy a, uh, a grinder. And then for me, hand in hand with that was getting uh, the Veragrind uh, because that to me, the Wolverine system with the Veragrind was really key in being able for me to reproduce. I didn't want to take the energy to learn to hand turn. There's some tools you have to hand turn, but some, I uh, uh, just didn't want to go there. The other thing is that um, I use these kind of stones. I don't use the diamond or CBN wheels. And principally, for me, the one reason is that I know when I'm getting to the point where my tool is sharp is by watching the spark trail over that leading edge. And there's no spark trail on the CBN or the diamond wheels. So that all relies on proper setup. And I just like the ability to watch that edge come into focus with its sharpness. But despite everything, the first thing you have to do before you sharpen is take care of your stone. And you can see that this stone is pretty filthy, right? So there's a couple ways to take care of that. Um, a lot of people use one of these, and uh, when I'm working on the stone, I'm wearing a dust mask. That's pure silica there, <laughs> or aluminum oxide silicates. So you can take this. So all you people in the front row now, right? So that'll get me. That'll get me somewhat there, all right. But if you have a groove that you have to take out, okay, doing it with one of these is a significant endeavor. So. I use one of these. Anybody use one of these? This is Don Geiger's, all right? And this has a massive diamond in the front, single point diamond. It's got a ledge in the back, all right, that hooks on the back side of the table. And this screw allows you to turn it in and out.
let that wind down. The other thing is about stones. Normally, these things come with two, two grits. Um, you can have a 60 or an 80 on one side, maybe 120 on the other side. If you're going to do a lot of tool reshaping, having maybe a 46 on one side and an 80 on the other side is okay. All right, uh, 120 will give you finer scratches, but um, for me, I, I would think a coarse and a medium is probably good enough. If you get a CBN wheel, you can get up to 600 grit. Um, that'll give you really, really fine edge. But again, one of the things about that is having your proper setup so that everything is set up with the geometry of the wheel. Now, one thing you do have in your advantage with either CBN or diamond wheel is the diameter doesn't change, all right? So, one of the things with an abrasive wheel is the diameter gets smaller. So you can't, when you're talking about using this, you can't have this in a fixed location. You can't make a mark here on, on the sleeve and uh, say, oh, that's where I put it in for a bowl gouge. Because as the abrasive stone gets sh smaller, all right, this has to keep going in in order to maintain that same geometry. So you have to use another way to set that up. For a diamond or CBN wheel, this doesn't change diameter, so you can mark it if you want. But you see that did a pretty good job of cleaning up that wheel, and, uh, and it, it took care of any grooves that are in there. One of the things you should always think about doing is trying to use is the whole surface of the stone um, not just always go into the center because you're, you'll wear that out. Now the other thing about stones is not only the grit, whether it's a 46 or 60 or 80 or 120, there's also a thing called the friability. And that is how aggressive the resin matrix holds on to the um, aggregate, all right? And what that means is the lower the, the letter, that's a letter like an I or J or K, is the, the more friable it is. And that means the more the abrasive will break apart and give you cleaner cutting surfaces each time, but it means that the stone is softer and you wear down your stone faster. So if you're, again, if you're going to do reshaping of things, a harder stone like a K is probably going to be better than a soft stone like an I. All right? Because if you're, if you're doing a lot of dramatic grinding, um, and we'll show that in a little bit, um, the, um, you'll, you'll wear out your stones faster, okay? A, a soft stone, and I, I brought one of each today so you can, you can check this out. One of the reasons that people were so concerned about the speed of your grinder, everybody wants to go to a slow speed grinder now, 1800 RPM, rather than 3600 or whatever. And that's because of heat generation. It's the same thing with the more friable uh, stones. The more friable they are, the softer they are, the more that they break apart and give you fresh aggregate. And that sharp aggregate sharpens with less heat generation, okay? But one of the real reasons for doing that was for people that were still using high carbon tools, okay? High carbon tools um, temper at about 500 degrees. And once you hit the, temp the, the tempering temperature, you're gonna lose your temper um, on a carbon tool. On a high speed steel tool, it's a much more elaborate temper tempering thing. They're, and they, they control it based on the metals, whether it's M2 or whatever. But um, it'll be between 700 something and 900 degrees to be the, the, um, the tempering temperature. And it, you're not as likely to lose your temper. But if you see in, um, if you ever use high carbon um, steel tools and you turn them blue, you, it's gone, all right? You have to grind all that blue off and, and, and um, get back below that. And if it's bad enough, you can reheat treat, okay? 
And you can do that by, if any of you have played when we've done tool making, you know that we put a torch on it and you watch the, the color start moving up the, uh, the shaft and you're looking for a dark straw. The dark straw is the equivalent of that 470 to 500 degrees. If you're dealing without a handle and you're just dealing with the metal, you can do it in a 500 degree oven, okay? You'll put the steel in and when you, after you take it out, it'll be golden because you've hit the temper, tempering temperature. Um, so, I've got, I'll go through some of the easier ones first. Um, and I didn't sharpen all of these <laughs> because I was going to do them here, so I wanted to um, really show you what they turn out like. So, um, spindle roughing gouge, the nice thing about a spindle roughing gouge is the geometry is exactly the same across the whole bevel, all right? So this is one of those that you can put in your V-block set it here and you can just do it by by turning it. Now um, it's nice here because we have really nice lighting and I can get to it in my shop it's a little dark where I do that um, at Safe Harbor when we do it for the boys it's a little darker as well so one of the things this is pretty classic if you take a magic marker, you put a mark all the way across the bevel face. You lean that against there. And now you can see that while it started to take off the ink, it took off a little bit of the heel more. So I'm going to move it back just a hair. And now that's pretty even across, all right? So now I'm going to, I'm going to sharpen this. All of my tools, you will see my hands will be pretty close to the stone. The farther I get away from the stone, the more lever angle I can put on it, lever, level force I can put on it, which can rock the bevel. So I'm just going to sit it in the V-block. Fred, can you catch that? Can you get him close enough right mm -hmm. at the... Because watch what's happening. You see those sparks coming over the leading edge? Mm -hmm. That's sharp. All right? It raises a burr, but that burr will go pretty quick. You can get rid of the burr if you want. But you can see that's sharp all the way around. You normally get rid of your burr and... No. <laughs> It, you lose it in 10 seconds anyway. Okay. Um, you do? Yeah, you would get rid of it. But I'm not doing carbon tools tonight. So, um, the other thing is parting tools. Now, you could do that in, a, in the V pocket, um, but I tend to do this in a little different way. Um, first of all, you have to pull it out so far and all of that. What I tend to do here, I do it freehand, although you can do it with a table too. But I, here what I, I want to do is avoid a series of different bevels across here. So what I'm going to do is start at the heel and then just slowly drop this down until I see the sparks coming off of the, over the leading edge. So 
So by doing it that way and taking it easy with it, you can um, just start here and take it till you just get that point. If this is a carbon tool, you can burn that pretty easy because there's not much steel there, all right? And I do have water for some of them where I'm gonna do a little bit extra um, grinding. Uh, but anyway, this is uh, for a parting tool. For some of the thin parting tools, um, there are a couple of issues with them. One is because they're thin, they're not much metal. So you, you don't want to uh, really spend a lot of time on it. And the Nick Cook ones, the, the top of that, all right, this is a, actually a U here. So you're only going to sharpen this face right there. All right? You don't sharpen the top at all. You're just taking this back farther and farther because it's a really shallow little U. Because the idea with that is it's cutting up these two edges. All right. Um, yeah. yeah. Are there any special degrees for the roughing gas? Um, you know, people do uh, lots of different things. I I don't really measure it. Um, the standard is supposed to be 20, 20 degrees. Um, I'm probably a little more than 20. All right, but you don't definitely you don't want it that blunt, and you don't want it that uh, shallow. If you're going to shallow, you're going to vibrate this cutting edge. If it's blunt, it doesn't give you really much room to vacate the chips underneath the bevel. Um, you can create a device like this. Now, the trouble I have with this is I can... It, it has so many scales on it, it's really hard to read. So that's about 35. All right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I could use it. Um, let's see what else. Let's go back to the table again. We'll do this before we get into the gouges. Now, with my roughing gouge, I generally um, have it at a little bit more of an angle than I do my scrapers. Okay. So this is another one of those that I like to See that just took off at the top. So I have to raise the table up. Oh, that's so there it's taking it off at the bottom. And this is really hollow ground, so I'm not going to get the middle part out. So I'm going to call that good because I got the part of the top and part of the bottom. Watch, be careful with this hand from a safety standpoint. You want to be very conscious of where you are in relation to the stone. But I'm going to use the bottom of the table as an anchor point and my thumb on the top. Oh. No. 
Okay, and the thing is I'm putting a fair amount of pressure down on the table. You don't want to have this ride up or rock to one side, all right? Let me get on this, this side I have to get a little bit. that edge because it's so thick and the, with the diameter of the stone you've got a lot of hollow grind but that gives you a pretty sharp top you also have a a, a burr here and burr will cut you know again for about 10 seconds did you ever do the negative rate scraper yeah speaking of it just a square scraper I um, Rounded it with a little, uh, a little rounded face on it. The this side is ground at the same side as I did the other scraper, and then that's the negative rake. And and it's the same thing as the other ones. Sometimes you need to be able to do some adjustment. <laughs> That's pretty close. So again, same kind of movement, except I'm at a much steeper angle. Fingers locked, thumb on it. do that and then I will go back for the next three or four times I'll do it like it's a scraper that'll raise a burr up on this side all right and it'll and it's that side up when you're doing your scraping yeah okay. the whole idea about a negative rake scraper is when you When you're trying to scrape something, you're always going to have your tool rest above center so that your scraper all right, is facing downhill. Because you, this is where you want to, there's no bevel rubbing here really. You're just trying to put a heavy duty edge with a scrape off this. If you're like this, you have the potential for a catastrophic. Um, and I'll bet you some of you have, if you're doing the inside of a bowl, you're doing the bottom, everything's cool, and you're starting to come up the wall, and the wall's pretty thin, and the wall then changes its shape a little bit, and all of a sudden you hear a <laughs> and you've got a nice gouge. It's because you the, as you come around, you've lost that, um, that angle. All right. Now, a negative brake scraper the tool rest is at center, at the midpoint and when you put the the gouge against it I mean the scraper against it, it gives you that angle automatically. All right. So you've got the cutting edge here and you've got that so you don't have to hold it up off the tool rest. You can rest it flat 
horizontal to the ways, and that'll uh, be less aggressive and uh, less prone to catch. And I have found that you, you can't remove wood with that, all right? It gets dull very quickly, so you better be prepared to do a fair amount of sharpening when you got a negative rate. All right, and uh, let's see. Ed, on the, on the negative break, I think it was either Bonnie Klein or Cindy Drozzi, one of the two of them, who said that she found that 67 degrees was the good sum total. Okay. Between the bottom angle and the top the, angle. The occluded angle? Yeah. So, so that's... You can mess around with it however you want, like 45 that, or 22 or something. That's this one, right? Right. That should be 67. Okay, sounds cool. Um... Next one I'm going to do is a skew, and a skew is also an occluded angle. If you look at it from the top, this angle here should be 40. Um, that's too hard for me to measure, right? So the standard um, way of looking at sizing your bevel to get that angle is one and a half times the thickness of your tool. Okay, so this isn't quite there. When you can see the thickness here, this is probably just a little bit over, but this is kind of where I like it. I don't like the really, really big bevels. I find that the tip on those or that end is just too prone to vibration and that. But if you don't have it, if, if you have it too stumpy, it'll never cut into the wood, uh, never allow you to do V-cuts and, and toe cuts and all that stuff well. So this is another one of those where you've got to um, do the, set the table in relationship to the stone. And um, you want this one to be repeatable. So I just created a pretty simple little jig, all right? Um, what I did is I got, when my skew was right, I, you know, I took my skew and said, oh, this is the angle I like it at. I just sharpened it, everything's cool. <coughs> I get a piece of wood, set it on here, scribed a line for where the stone was, and then actually what I did is I sanded out a little of this, so it really only has two points of contact, down here and here. So you set that on your table. amazing. There we go. Okay, so I'm riding. This is flat on the table, and I'm contacting right here and right here. All right. Now, there's different profiles that you can grind. For my larger gouge, I like this little convex shape. All right. This is not as dramatic as Lacer. Although I did his for a long time, the big difference on Lacer's is that a third of his is square across, and then he drops down. All right? On mine, I'm starting the, that curve right from here. 
and not going quite as far as he does. All right. So this one is same kind of thing, but now I've got to rotate it with um, this curve. And uh, I, sh I did sharpen this one, and you can feel, you want to feel the edge on that. That's pretty sharp. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And for a skew, you really need to be there. So again, I think I'll, just for grins, Because I just sharpened it, an awful lot of it is is hollow ground, so I'm not getting to it. But yeah, there we go. I'm taking it off up here. So let me take care of that. And now for this, rather than let this go across the whole surface, I'm going to try and keep the spark trail where that spark is coming across in the same basic position on the stone, all right? I'm not going to start over here and end up, you know, sharpening here and then sharpening over here and then sharpening here. I'm going to try and keep that spark trail all in the same place. Touching on both ends, but in the middle I'm not, so I'm going to spend a little more time in the middle. Alright. So you can see the tendency here, what you have to be careful about doing with this one, and I'll do the other side in a minute is not letting your hands ride up and down, all right? And not let it rock. And of course, you're always, depending on what handedness you are, it's always going to be easier going one way than it is the other. have a little in that in the front. So um, most of you know I'm reasonably good friends with Michael Mosha and whenever he teaches one of the things he does is he brings a dead switch for the grinder. All right. And you can use this if you have a high-speed grinder. He steps on it, gets it revved up, takes his foot off, and as it's winding down, that's when he sharpens. All right? So he gets, it, it gets down to slow speed. And then he'll step on it again and take his foot off. Now, the skew is the one tool that you're not done with off the grinder. All right? For me, there's... Um, I use a diamond stone and there's, you can use all different kinds if you like these little credit card jobs you're going to rut that dead against flat against the against the bevel
Now you have to resist the temptation to do this. Okay, you don't want to rock across the top. The other thing you need to do is that takes care of the top point and that takes care of the bottom. Okay? Um, this is a this is the fine, it's the uh, the red one. Um, this one is is too different. It's oh, it just as coarse and fine. But I got this one here too. Um, but the real thing is you want to make sure that that you're flat against the bevel. And so you don't have to, with a skew, you do not have to take it back to the grinder. This is hollow ground, all right? So it's pretty easy, when this gets dull, take your, your diamond, come back to it, and what you'll see is you'll see across the top and across the bottom of the bevel, you'll start to see um, it get flat. You do that a few times, you're going to get rid of the hollow grind. As it starts approaching that hollow grind going away, go ahead and take it back to the, uh, the stone. Now, for a half inch gouge, I mean a half inch skew, um, I like this pretty much just square across. All right? So, These two should be the same, but you know how it is. So in this case, I'm going to put it at the angle so that this, the angle I want here is parallel to the, um, to the top of the table. And I'm just going to move it side to side. this, because it's straight across, is a lot easier to um, um, So here's one more skew. Now the one thing about this skew is it's much thinner. All right, so theoretically, I don't use this, I'm just, this is a demo piece. Um, so I, I probably need a longer bevel than is on there right now. But I want to show you a difference between the two steels.
Can you see that? That's because this is high carbon steel. All right. It's like a sparkle. So if you see that, know that you have to be less aggressive on your sharpening. The reality is a high carbon steel tool will end up sharper off a grinder than will high speed steel. Okay? But that edge just won't last as long. But um, but the other thing is, as I was talking about before, the temper temper temperature on this is 500, 470. So once if you start seeing sparks like that, you know you got to be careful and have water definitely nearby. All right. Um, okay. Let's move on to the gouges. Um, how many of you know <coughs> your gouges and their shape, their flute shapes? Do you pay any attention to that? All right. So, what kind of shapes are there? Yeah. So, the three shapes. like that. And that's a V, this is a parabolic, and this is a U. And different manufacturers make them different. And in the case of Thompson, he makes a couple of different ones. All right. And the thing about them is the, the way you sharpen these changes the relationship to these edges. The geometry here, even if you sharpen them all the same, this relationship to this to this is all different depending on which kind of flute geometry you have. And um, these are Daniels. I'll, I'll send these around. That uh, Daniel, why don't you explain which is which to them while I... While you're setting up? Setting up, yeah. Because we both have the same thing. He and I both have all three types that we sharpen with the same, the same way, all right? So again, our edge geometry changes from gouge to gouge a little bit, and you can tell that. So the dark handle is a crown stock, um, Ellsworth grind, right? <coughs> so that's what Ellsworth said, this is parabolic, that's why I said different manufacturers claim that theirs is parabolic, but there's a variation here than the other folks. So that's that one. Um, the two dark steel ones are both Thompsons, and one is a Lyle Jameson, which is more parabolic, <coughs> but he claims this is slightly different from David's, and if you're really interested, you can call him and talk to him about it. Uh, and this one, um, which has old Henry Taylor handle on it, so you can reuse your handles. This is a Henry Taylor that I ground out and I couldn't grind it anymore. Um, is also Thompson. It's not the Jameson parabolic grind, it's just sort of the standard Thompson. But that's what Ed was talking about when he said both Thompson, but slightly different tools. And the last one is the newest one I just got, which is a one way. And it's probably the most significant difference when you look right down the flute, the one way versus the others. They told me it was V, and I probably should have sent it back and said, that's not, I mean, they told me it was parabolic, and I should have sent it back and said, that's not parabolic, it's you. But, um, but we'll see. I, I, I really am a believer, as other people have talked about, of repeatability, muscle memory. So if you're getting the same steel and you, you're grinding it with the same jig and everything else, you're going to, your muscles are going to, and, and then I started thinking, well, yeah, but you don't always have your tools, and you're not always with your jig, and all that sort of stuff. So it's probably not a bad idea to have a little bit. So I guess one of the things is, I, both of us tend to not like a deep V. 
because it's, it's pretty sure. hard for the chips to get the hell out of Dodge. So um, we more like a parabolic one. Um, but, uh, and I don't know if I have a real UU one. I mean, I have one that is definitely a little bit different than elliptical. Um, but I bought some of these, I inherited some of these, and so they're all pretty different. So, but let me go through the, the sharpening of the bowl gouges. Um, I think generally people talk about bowl gouges being in that 58 to 65 degree angle kind of thing with people saying 60 is probably the norm. Definitely Doug Thompson says 60 is the norm. So what do I mean by 60? If I take a... Okay that bevel face to the shaft should be about a 60 degree and that's what I try and set up my stuff to give me. All right. The other thing is, well, how do you do that? How do you set up your, how do you set up the grinder? You've got three things to deal with on a, on a bear grind. All right. One of them is the stick out. One of them is the pivot, arm pivot, and the third one is the distance of that pivot from the stone face. So the first thing I do so your, your preference on the shape is larger based on the way character of the chips? Yes. And well there are some differences because I like Ellsworth. I like an Ellsworth grind. Alright, so I for for my bowl gouges, I use an Ellsworth um, I use this, not a Wolverine. All right, and it's different. He looks. He wants a two-inch stick out. This is a different angle than the Wolverine is, and he's doing that because he wants the 60 degrees on the nose, and a 60 degree all the way around. Because the way he uses this gouge, he wants to be able to use it so that he can have the same geometry as he goes around the inside of a bowl. All right. Um, some of the others will look at getting a, um, a much different relationship between the nose and the sides, a 60 here or 62 here and a 45 on the sides. And so, but as Daniel's saying, a lot of it is muscle memory. If you've gotten to the point where you know, you've learned to use your bowl gouge and you can create bowls reasonably well. As long as the grind is repeatable, you can use that tool. The problem is when you're using other people's tools, you're using other people's grinders and setups, and you don't, you're not able to get back to your grind. And so what you're used to isn't going to make it on here. So, the, the, the three things I control this way, bowl gouge, 60 degrees, set that in the pocket, bring that up, tighten that down. And that sets my distance from the pocket to the stone face. And it doesn't matter if this wears, it'll just, this will keep going in closer and closer each time. So then I'm going to use my Ellsworth. Now the next thing I want to do is control my stick out. So I have um, a block of wood with holes drilled in it. This one's drilled to two inches. All right. And on the Ellsworth system, the third one, this angle, which you can change on a Veragrind, you can't change on an Ellsworth. It's fixed. All right. So for me, that's all I need. Use this jig, that setting. 
Now, one of the other things that I do, like I was saying before, I don't have my hand down here on the handle. It's, it, a little motion here makes a big change up here. So I'm going to hold the jig. And I do it in three, in three passes. I'm going to start on the right side and work on the right side to the back left side to the back and then blend between the, the nose, right? So that's a little different than my grinder setup at home. So it's all right. I don't know if you can see it, but right in the middle I have a little bit of a higher spot. Can you see that? No. So I'm gonna Now you may think the jig is doing all the work for you. It is not. It's up to you to control that profile. Okay? So what I'm looking for is a slight slightly convex shape, all right? There are a lot of people that like it straight across. Never convex shape, okay? You never have your point as higher than anywhere on the wings. The wings are either the same or higher, all right? And now I'm gonna do the other side. across the nose. So for me I got stuff in the way. Because I'd rather have the control on this. I, I'd rather have the control to do them as three separate motions because they're not the same. What I do on the nose is different than I'm doing on the sides. Okay, and and because the one thing you have to be very careful about the nose is where it's hard to grind away too much on the sides. It's easy to grind away too much on the nose. All right. And so I have watched people come in um, to classes and, and just can't believe what these things look like, where they ground the nose back so that it's, it's a flat. It's, it's actually like a chisel in the front. Or the, the other thing that is bad is when I like, I like this shape. All right, this little bit of a sweep. <laughs> Coming straight, fine too. This is a bad thing. All right. Where you have your nose higher. So this is one you really, you really have to bring this back down here, at least go to straight across. But if you grind too much here, It'll tend to look like this from the top. This will almost be flat across there. And you won't, you'll have a sharp point here and a sharp point here. You want this to be a nice smooth parabola all the way. So, lighting okay for that? Mm -hmm. And then, 
And once I have this, this setup works for everything. All right? Now, I'm also a believer in Doug Thompson tools, but I just haven't needed a bowl gouge yet. And they're fairly pricey, but I do like Doug for the spindle gouges. All right, so this is his detail gouge, and this one I will use the Veragrind for. All right, so one thing that I can make things work easier in my favor is if I have it in a removable handle, take it out and I'm just dealing with this little piece of steel rather than that handle being in the way. Um, so this one, I'll do the same thing except this one is the Thompson stick out. This is one and three quarter inch. Ellsworth is two inches. Okay, so there I have my stick out. Thompson spindle gouge with the black Veragrind. I just reset the, the other one. Uh-oh. I can't. I can't do it on this one. That's easy. Okay, I'm going to have to guess. My thing on the bottom is farther back, so I can get this Don't up. Tell the safety officer you took yeah, well, I'm not taking it off. <laughs> so, have any of you seen this before? Anybody use it? Yeah. So, what this is for is you put your, your Vera grind here, and you loosen this, and you put the leg to match this as the exact placement for Doug's grind. All right, and once you get this in that position, that's all you have to do. He uses the same leg position and the same stick out for everything. Bowl gouges, spindle gouges, doesn't matter. Okay? So this is going to be the same deal. So this is the same. What angle is that at? Um, this is at 40. Okay. All right. 40 on all sides? Um, it, it's not the same on a spindle gouge as it is on a bowl gouge because you don't have the meat on the side. You have more of a sweep back here, but look, compare these in terms of the flute relationship to the total diameter. All right. There's a lot more meat out here to have a bevel. This really doesn't have a bevel like that. All right? So, that's 40 degrees. Now, well, yeah, right at 40 degrees. Okay? And this is his spindle detail gouge. Now, I did bring. I haven't used it yet, but let me just compare the two. This is his regular spindle gouge, so you can see how different they are, okay? But it's the same, he uses the same, um, the same setup. Now the reason that is, is because
you're looking at them nose on, what he does is for the standard, he cuts the flute about here. All right? So you pretty much have pretty close to the center anyway. So what you end up with is a profile that's pretty much round. All right? For the um, detail gouge, he cuts it up here. And now you've got all this steel, and that's why you have to do this, a swept back grind on that, because he cuts it higher than the other one. And so because of that, um, you've got to take away some of the metal on the side. And that's why you have to have a sweep back in here where you don't need it for, for this one, okay? Thompson tools come sharp right out of the package, so you can use them right as it is. But again, it's the same, um, it's the same setup as this. It's a one and three quarter stick out. That same setting that this puts your vera grind in, and then um, you match it up so that your your distance away from the stone is gets that angle right in there. All right. Um, and this is another detail. This is a smaller one. But you can see the detail ones are much pointier, all right, and uh, than the regular spindle gouges. But this flute, look how shallow that flute is compared to all that steel is below it, you know. All right. Um, <clears throat> this is another one. This is a P and N. Look at the shape of that flute, all right? That's a pretty deep V, right? But this is done in a, in a traditional grind. And so this is one. It's just sharpened like you would sharpen a roughly go. All right, but you also see that I put a secondary bevel on that. All right, so that's just done freehand. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I, you know, I bought this one a long time ago. I haven't used it very much. I would say for Using it as a traditional grind for that final pass on an inside of a bowl where you're not taking off a lot of stuff, evacuating a lot of wood is not your real deal. You want to get a nice clean cut. That does reasonably well. Then, of course, you've got, um, there is another grind that you do, um, and I just do this setup on my own uh, where I have that nose is it about, Instead of being a 60 degree, it's like an 80 degree, all right? Very steep, and that's for doing the bottom of the bowl. And just like most of these, you can take this, you can go and go even more aggressive than that, but just grind off the heel. And why would you do that? Well, when you're doing the inside of a bowl, This, from here to here, is easy. From here to here is where you get into trouble, as because you're starting to run into the end grain head on. And what happens is if that, if you have a long bevel and a sharp heel, you're cutting here, and that gouge behind you is giving you compression marks as it comes across that curve from here to here. And so you'll see that 
uh, you can see little dark lines. Sometimes you wonder, where the heck did those come from? Well, they came from the heel of the gouge. So if you relieve that, if you grind that off, all you're doing is running with a shorter bevel. Who cares, you know? On, the, on my 80 degree gouge, it kind of looks like this. You know, all I care about is this little bit here, and this is about at that 80 degrees. So that means when I come in, first of all, if I want to start up here, my handle has to be <laughs> way over here to, for that 80 degrees to come in with a cut. But when I get here, I can cut on that short bevel. The heel isn't rubbing at all, and it allows me to come through. For a bowl like this, that's not critical, all right? For a calabash, you betcha. Because you can't get your gouge in this area. <coughs> you can't, with a conventional grind, you can't get it and have your handle not run into the upper rim of the, of the calabash. So having something that allows you to come more straight in and still have an angle to go across, that's why I have one of these. All right. I'm going to do, I'm going to skip a few things. I've gotten through most of it, but the one thing I'm going to do um, now is this. This is a shop fox um, gouge. Uh, you can see this is how it comes right out of the package. It's brand new. It's the same way sorbies come out of the package, pretty much like this. That's not how you really want to use them, all right? So you're going to want to spill all your water on the floor. So, what you're going to really want to do with this is begin to get yourself the shape of a swept back out. And what do you do there? Well, really all you're going to do is take off this. Your nose is probably okay. That angle here is probably okay. Let's see where we're at. We're at 60. Pretty close, about maybe 55 or so, but that's okay. So what you really want to do now is give yourself that slight convex profile. And Doug tends to do it like this. And I've tended to do it like this. And so what does that give me, all right? Look at the shape of where the flute is, all right? The only thing I have to do now is get rid of the steel on the side. I want to I wanna get rid of the steel so the steel ends right at that profile of the inside flute, all right? So again, I'm going to, I'll do it with... With Doug set up. Since I'm using this step back, let me use this.
And one thing about this um, that you'll figure out after a while is that um, the flute, you'll run out of flute. You'll, let's say the, the jig will stop you from using all the available flute. All right? So I have done and I've seen people done where they just um, grind this flat here so that the, the, um, this can sit against a flat surface and uh, you, you can use the whole length of the flute. Some people do that by just giving you a little itty bitty flute. <laughs> it works out too fast. So once again, I'm going to do right side, left side.
Say again? You just said you're looking for the spark trail. Uh, the over the whole trail. edge. Over the top. Yeah, over the top. And you can feel that as it goes around. But that, you know, from as ugly a shape as that was, it took, you know, five or six minutes to get it into what looks like a regular swept back grind. Now I will tell you, the first time you do that, you get pretty nervous, especially if it's an $85 gouge. Um, the first time you do it for someone else, you also get nervous. <laughs> and when you do it in front of folks, you get nervous. But if you've done it a few times, um, it's not that big a deal. Because what you've done, by doing that first grind, you shown the shape that you have to get to, all right? And that, that shape is a function of the flute geometry. You're not gonna change that. So now it's just a matter of taking the sides down to that, that profile of that flute that by grinding that little profile in the front when you, uh, when you took off all the steel, that's all it took. Now you're getting back to it. Um, just a few other things. I typically don't hone my gouges, but some people do. All right. Um, I do. I have some special tools. Oh, let me do. Just, I got a few more minutes. Um, High-speed steel hollowing tools. Okay, where you just it's an Ellsworth light tool. I have real Ellsworth tools. And he will take his and put him on it, put it on a table and do that. Um, that works okay. I, I sometimes have a little difficulty with the size of the tool because he has long handles on his trying to get them. So I just as often do this. Okay. And that gives you a pretty sharp edge. What it does not give you, which the other one does, the other one gives you a burr, and this one doesn't. But the burr's not going to be there that long anyway. All right. So that's when I have my big Ellsworth tools, I do that that way as well. Um, there are some other tools. There are two kinds of hooks. This is a Hasla hook, and on this one, the bevel's on the outside. We've had um, lacers, bevels are on the inside, okay? But for this, I'll just take a, a diamond paddle and go up and down the, the bevel face. Okay, and I can get that, that hook pretty sharp. If I want to do the inside or get rid of the burr, I can take, I actually couldn't find it tonight. I have a half round one that's made just for these. This is a fish hook um, hone, and you can do this on the inside. And for the lacer kind of skews, I mean uh, hook tools, you can use this to sharpen it because, like I say, the bevel's on the inside for his. All right. Um, oh, one more tool I had. And this was because of uh, 
Harvey. What was his name? Harvey Meyer. Harvey Meyer. I think everybody went out and bought the beaver tool. So one of the things that works works fine without a handle. If you, if you make a handle you can go in and out of, fine too. If you glue a handle on here, you're going to have to put a smaller riser block on your table. <coughs> so, So you can see I got the whole surface. This is hollow ground now. So just like with a skew, you can sharpen this uh, you know, with a diamond hone for a while. But that's, that's how you sharpen one of these tools. There, I mean, you've got thousands of different kinds of deals. You know, <coughs> the only tool you don't have to sharpen is an easy tool. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.